to. Next, a hearing on efforts to identify and remove violent and extremist content from the web. Representatives from Google, Facebook, Twitter, and the Anti-Defamation League testified before the Senate Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee. The hearing is two hours and 10 minutes. hearing will come to order. Good morning. Today the committee gathers to discuss what the technology industry is doing to remove violent and extremist content from their platforms. This is a matter of serious importance to the safety and well-being of our nation's communities. I sincerely hope we can engage in a collaborative discussion about what more can be done within the jurisdiction of this committee to keep our communities safe from those wishing to do us harm. Today we welcome representatives from the world's largest social media companies and online platforms. We hear from Ms. Monica Bickert, head of the global policy management for Facebook, and Mr. Nick Pickles, public policy director at Twitter, Mr. Derek Slater, global director of information policy at Google, and Mr. George Salim, Senior Vice President of Programs for the Anti-Defamation League. Over the past two decades, the United States has led the world in development of social media and other services that allow people to, to connect with one another. Open platform providers like Google, Twitter, and Facebook, and products like Instagram and YouTube have dramatically changed the way we communicate and have been used positively in providing spaces for like-minded groups to come together and in shedding light on despotic regimes and abuses of power throughout the world. No matter how great the benefits to society these platforms provide, it is important to consider how they can be used for evil at home and abroad. On August 3rd, 2019, 20 people were killed and more than two dozen were injured in a mass shooting at an El Paso shopping center. Police have said that they are reasonably confident that the suspect posted a manifesto to a website called 8chan 27 minutes prior to the shooting. 8chan moderators removed the original post, though users continued sharing copies. Following the shooting, President Trump called on social media companies to work in partnership with local, state, and federal agencies to develop tools that can detect mass shooters before they strike. I certainly hope we talk about that challenge today. Sadly, the El Paso shooting is not the only recent example of mass violence with an online dimension. On March 15, 2019, 51 people were killed and 49 were injured in shootings at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. The perpetrator filmed the attacks using a body camera and live streamed the footage to his Facebook followers who began to reload the footage to Facebook and other sites. Access to the footage quickly spread and Facebook stated that it removed 1.5 million videos of the massacre within 24 hours of the attack. 1.2 million views of the videos were blocked before they could be uploaded. Like the El Paso shooter, the Christchurch shooter also uploaded a manifesto to 8 Chan. The 2016 shooting at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida killed 49 and injured 53 more. The Orlando shooter was reportedly radicalized by ISIS and other jihadist propaganda through online sources. Days after the attack, the FBI director stated that investigators were highly confident that the shooter was self-radicalized through the internet. According to an official involved in the investigation, analysis of the shooter's electronic devices revealed that he had consumed 
quote, a hell of a lot of jihadist propaganda, unquote, including ISIS beheading videos. Shooting survivors and family members of victims brought a federal lawsuit against those three social media platforms under the Anti-Terrorism Act. The Sixth Circuit dismissed the lawsuit on grounds that this was not an act of international terrorism. With over 3.2 billion internet users, this committee recognizes the challenge facing social media companies and online platforms. Their ability to act and remove content threatening violence from their sites. These are questions about whether the, there are tra uh, questions about tracking of a user's online activity. Does this invade an individual's privacy, thwart due process? or violate constitutional rights. The automatic removal of threatening content may also impact an online platform's ability to detect possible warning signs. Indeed, the First Amendment offers strong protections against restricting certain speech. This undeniably adds to the complexity of our task. I hope these witnesses will speak to these challenges and how their companies are navigating these challenges. In today's internet connected society, misinformation, fake news, deep fakes, and viral online conspiracy theories have become the norm. This hearing is an opportunity for witnesses to discuss how their platforms go about identifying content and material that threatens violence and poses a real and potentially immediate danger to the public. I hope our witnesses will also discuss how their content moderation processes work. This includes addressing how human review or technological tools are employed to remove or otherwise limit violent content before it is posted, copied, and disseminated across the internet. Communication with law enforcement officials at the federal, state, and local levels is critical to protecting our neighborhoods and communities. Uh, we would like to know how companies are coordinating with law enforcement when violent or extremist content is identified. And finally, I hope witnesses will discuss how Congress can assist in ongoing efforts to remove content promoting violence from online platforms and whether best practices or industry codes of conduct in this area would help increase safety both online and offline. So I look forward to hearing testimonies from our witnesses. Hope we engage in a constructive discussion about potential solutions to a pressing issue. And I'm delighted at this point to recognize my friend and ranking member, Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important hearing and for our witnesses being here this morning. Across the country, we are seeing and experiencing a surge of hate, and as a result, we need to think much harder about the tools and resources we have to combat this problem, both online and offline. While the First Amendment to the Constitution protects free speech, speech that incites imminent violence is not protected, and Congress should review and strengthen laws that prohibit threats of violence, harassment, stalking, intimidation, to make sure that we stop the online behavior that does incite violence. In testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee in July, Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI Director Chris Way said that the white supremacist violence is on the rise. He said the FBI takes this threat quote, extremely seriously, end quote, and has made over 100 arrests so far this year. We are seeing in my state over the last several years, we have suffered a shooting at the Jewish Community Center in Seattle, a shooting of a Sikh in Kent, Washington, a bombing attempt at the Martin Luther King Day Parade in Spokane, and over the last year, we've seen a rise in the desecration of both synagogues and mosques. The rise in hate across the country has also led to multiple mass shootings, including the Tree of Life congregation in Pittsburgh, the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, and most recently, the Walmart in El Paso. Social media is used to amplify that hate, and the shooter at, uh, as, at uh, one high school in, in uh, the Parkland posting 
said the image of himself and guns and knives on Instagram wrote social media posts prior to the attack on his fellow students. In El Paso, the killer published a white supremacist anti-immigration manifesto on 8chan and message board, and my colleague just mentioned the streaming of live content related to the Christ Church uh, shooting, the horrific incidents that happened there. In Myanmar, the military engaged in a systematic campaign on Facebook using fake names and sham accounts to promote violence against Muslim Rohingya. These human lives were all cut short by deep hatred and extremism that we have seen has become more common. This is a particular problem on the dark web where we see certain websites like 8chan and a host of 24-7, 365 hate rallies adding technology tools to mainstream websites to stop the spread of these dark websites is a start, but there needs to be more to be a comprehensive and coordinated effort to ensure that people are not directed into these cesspools. I believe calling on the Department of Justice to make sure that we are working across the board on an international basis with companies as well to fight this issue is an important thing to be done. We don't want to push people off of social media platforms only to then be on the dark web where we are finding less of them. We need to do more at the Department of Justice to shut down these dark web sites and social media companies need to work with us to make sure that we are doing this. I do want to mention just last week, as there's much discussion here in Washington about uh, initiatives, the state of Washington has passed three uh, gun initiatives by the vote of the people, closing background loopholes and also private, uh, re relating to private sales and extreme person laws, all voted on by a majority of people uh, in our state have successfully passed. So I do appreciate uh, just last week representatives from various companies of all sizes in the tech industry sending the center a letter pass asking for passage of bills requiring extensive background checks. So very much appreciate that and your support of extreme person laws to keep the guns out of the hands of people who uh, a court has determined are uh, dangerous in the possession of that. So this morning, we look to forward to asking you about ways in which we can better fight these issues. I do want us to think about ways in which we can all work together to address these issues. I feel that working together, uh, these are successful tools that we can deploy in trying to fight extremism that exists online. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the hearing. Thank you very, very much. And uh, now we will um, hear um, um, oral testimony from our four witnesses, and we ask you, uh, uh, your entire statements will be uh, submitted for the record without objection. We ask you to limit your comments at this point to five minutes. Ms. Bickert, you're recognized. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chairman Wicker, Ranking Member Cantwell, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to answer your questions and explain our efforts in these areas. My name is Monica Bickert, and I am Facebook's Vice President for Global Policy Management and Counterterrorism. I'm responsible for our rules around content on Facebook and our company's response to terrorist would-be attempts to use our services. On behalf of everyone at Facebook, I'd be, like to begin by expressing my sympathy and solidarity with the victims, families, communities, and everybody affected by the recent terrible attacks across the country. In the face of such heinous acts, we remain committed to assisting law enforcement and standing with the community against hate and violence. We're thankful to be able to provide a way for those affected by this horrific violence to communicate with loved ones, organize events for people to gather and grieve, raise money to help support communities, and begin to heal. Our mission is to give people the power to connect with one another and to build community. But we know that people need to be safe in order to build that community. And that's why we have rules in place against harmful conduct, including hate speech and inciting violence. Our goal is to ensure that Facebook is both a place where people can express themselves, but where they are also safe. While we're not aware of any connection between the recent attacks and our platform, we certainly recognize that we all have a role to play in keeping our community safe. That's why we remove content that encourages real-world harm, 
This includes content that is involving violence or incitement, promoting or publicizing crime, coordinating harmful activities, or encouraging suicide or self-injury. We don't allow any individuals or organizations who proclaim a violent mission, advocate for violence, or are engaged in violence to have any presence on Facebook, even if they are talking about something unrelated. This includes organizations and individuals involved in or advocating for terror activity, domestic and international, organized hate, and that includes white supremacy, white separatism, or white nationalism, or other violence. We also don't allow any content posted by anyone that praises or supports these individuals or organizations or their actions. When we find content that violates our standards, we remove it promptly. We also disable accounts when we see severe or repeated violations. And we work with law enforcement directly when we believe there is a risk of physical harm or a direct threat to public safety. While there is always room for improvement, we already remove millions of pieces of content every year from violating our policies, and much of that is before anybody has reported it to us. Our efforts to improve our enforcement of these policies are focused in three areas. First, building new technical solutions that allow us to proactively identify content that violates our policies. Second, investing in people who can help us implement these policies. At Facebook, we now have more than 30,000 people across the company who are working on safety and security efforts. This includes more than 350 people whose primary focus is counter hate and counter terrorism. And third, building partnerships with other companies, civil society, researchers, and governments so that together we can come up with shared solutions. We're proud of the work we've done thus far to make Facebook a hostile place for those engaged in or advocating for acts of violence, but the work will never be complete. We know that bad actors will continue to attempt to skirt detection with more sophisticated efforts, and we're dedicated to continuing to advance our work and share our progress. We look forward to working with the committee, regulators, others in the tech industry, and civil society cont to continue this progress. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Mr. Pickles. Chairman Wicker, <clears throat> Ranking Member Cantwell, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss these important issues. Twitter has publicly committed to improving the collective health, openness, and civility of public conversation on our platform. Our policies are designed to keep people safe on Twitter, and they continuously evolve to reflect the realities of the world we operate in. We are working faster, and we are investing to remove content that distracts from a healthy conversation before it's reported, including terrorist and violent extremist content. Tackling terrorism, violent extremism, and preventing violent attacks requires a whole of society response, including from social media companies. Let me be clear, Twitter is incentivized to keep terrorist and violent content off our service, both from a business standpoint and under current legal frameworks. Such content does not serve our business interests, it breaks our rules, and is fundamentally contrary to our values. Communities in America and around the world have been impacted by incidents of mass violence, terrorism, and violent extremism with tragic frequency in recent years. These events demand a robust public policy response from every quarter. We acknowledge that technology companies have a role to play. However, it's important to recognize content removal alone cannot solve these issues. I'd like to outline four of Twitter's key policies in this area. Firstly, Twitter takes a zero tolerance approach to terrorist content on our service. Individuals may not promote terrorism, engage in terrorist recruitment, or terrorist acts. Since 2015, we've suspended more than 1.5 million accounts for violations of our rules related to terrorism and continue to see more than 90% of these accounts suspended through our own proactive measures. In the majority of cases, we take action at the account creation stage before an account has even tweeted, and the remaining 10% is identified through a combination of user reports and partnerships. Secondly, we prohibit the use of Twitter by violent extremist groups. These are defined in our rules as groups that, whether by statements on or off the platform, use or promote violence against civilians to further their cause, whatever their ideology. Since the introduction of this policy in 2017, we've taken action on more than 
186 groups globally and suspended more than 2,000 unique accounts. Thirdly, Twitter does not allow hateful conduct on our service. An individual on Twitter is not permitted to threaten or promote violence or directly attack people based on their protected characteristics. Where any of these rules are broken, we will take action to remove the content and will permanently remove those promoting terrorism or violent extremism from Twitter. Fourthly, our rules prohibit the selling, buying, or facilitating transactions in weapons, including firearms, ammunition, and explosives, and instructions on making weapons, such as explosive devices or 3D printed weapons. We'll take appropriate action on any account found to be engaged in this activity, including a per um, permanent suspension where appropriate. Additionally, we prohibit the promotion of weapons and weapon accessories globally through our paid advertising policies. Collaboration with our industry peers and civil society is critically important to addressing the common threats from terrorism globally. In June 2017, we launched the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, GIFCT, a partnership with Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Microsoft. This facilitates, among other things, information sharing, technical cooperation, research collaboration, including with academic institutions. Twitter and technology companies have a role to play in addressing mass violence, ensuring our platforms cannot be exploited by those promoting violence. This cannot be the only public policy response, and removing content alone will not stop those who are determined to cause harm. Quite often, when we remove content from our platforms, it moves those views, these ideologies, into the darker corners of the internet, where they cannot be challenged and held to account. As our peer companies improve in their efforts, this content, content continues to migrate to less governed platforms and services. We are committed to learning and improving, but every part of the online ecosystem has a part to play. Addressing mass violence requires a whole of society response. We welcome the opportunity to continue to work with industry peers, government institutions, legislators, law enforcement, academics, and civil society to find the right solutions. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Mr. Slater. Chairman Wicker, Ranking Member Cantwell, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Derek Slater. I'm the Global Director of Information Policy at Google. In that capacity, I lead a team that advises the company on public policy frameworks for dealing with online content, including hate speech, extremism, and terrorism. Before I begin, I would like to take a moment on behalf of everyone at Google to express our horror and learning of the tragic attacks in Texas, Ohio, and elsewhere, and to share our sincere condolences to the affected families, friends, and communities. While Google services were not involved in these recent incidents, we've engaged with the White House, Congress, and governments around the globe on steps we are taking to ensure that our platforms are not used to support hate speech or incite violence. In my testimony today, I will focus on three key areas where we are making progress to help protect people. First, how we work with governments and law enforcement. Second, our efforts to prohibit the promotion of products that cause damage, harm, or injury. And third, the enforcement of our policies around terrorism and hate speech. First, Google engages in ongoing dialogue with law enforcement and agencies, and if law enforcement agencies to understand the threat landscape and respond to threats that affect the safety of our users and the broader public. For example, when we have a good faith belief that there is a threat to life or serious bodily harm made on our platform in the United States, the Google Cybercrime Investigation Group will report it to the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center. In turn, that intelligence center quickly gets the report into the hands of officers to respond. The Cybercrime Investigation Group is on call 24 seven to make these reports. We are also deeply committed to working with government the tech industry, and experts from civil society and academia. Since 2000, 2017, we've done this in particular through the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, of which YouTube is a founding company and was its first chair. Recently, GIFCT introduced joint content incident protocols for responding to emerging or active events. The GIFCT also released its first ever transparency report and a new counter speech campaign toolkit. Second. We take the threat posed by gun violence in the United States very seriously, and our advertising policies have long prohibited the promotion of weapons, ammunition, and similar products that cause damage, harm, or injury. Similarly, we also prohibit the promotion of instructions for making guns, explosives, or other harmful products. We employ a number of proactive and reactive measures to ensure that our policies are appropriately enforced. We know that we must be vigilant on these issues and are constantly improving our enforcement procedures including implementing enhancements to our automated systems 
and updating our incident management and manual review procedures. Third, on YouTube, we have rigorous policies and programs to defend against the use of our platform to spread hate or incite violence. Over the past two years, we have invested heavily in machines and people to quickly identify and remove content that violates our policies. This includes machine learning technology to effectively enforce our policies at scale, hiring over 10,000 people across a Google tasked with detecting, reviewing, and removing content, an Intel desk of experts that proactively looks for new trends, an improved escalation pathway for expert NGOs and governments to notify us of bad content in bulk through our trusted flagger program, and finally going beyond removals by actively creating programs to promote beneficial counter speech, such as the Creators for Change program and Alphabet's Jigsaw Group's use of the redirect method. This broad, cross-sectional work has led to tangible results. Over 87% of the 9 million videos we removed in the second quarter of 2019 were first flagged by our automated systems. More than 80% of those auto-flagged videos were removed before they received a single view. And overall, videos that violate our policies generate a fraction of a percent of the views on YouTube. Our efforts do not end there, as we are constantly evolving to new challenges and looking for ways to improve our policies. For example, YouTube recently further updated its hate speech policy. The updated policy specifically prohibits videos alleging that a group is superior in order to justify discrimination, segregation, or exclusion based on qualities like age, gender, race, caste, religion, sexual orientation, or veteran status. Though it can take months for us to ramp up enforcement of our new policies, we have already seen a 5x spike in removals and channel terminations on hate speech. In conclusion, we take the safety of our users very seriously and value our close and collaborative relationships with law enforcement and government agencies. We understand these are difficult issues of great interest to Congress and want to be responsible actors who are part of the solution. As these issues evolve, Google will continue to invest in the people and technology to meet the challenge. We look forward to continued collaboration with the committee as it examines these issues. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Salim, you, uh, you prefer, your group prefers to be known as ADL these days, is that correct? Correct. The Anti-Defamation League goes by ADL for short. Great. Good. Well, uh, we uh, appreciate you being with us today and uh, we're happy to receive your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cantwell. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with the distinguished members of this committee this morning. My name is George Salim, and I serve as the Senior Vice President for Programs at the ADL, or the Anti-Defamation League. And for decades, the ADL has fought against bigotry and anti-Semitism by exposing extremist groups and individuals who spread hate to incite violence. Today, the ADL is the foremost non-governmental authority on domestic terrorism, extremism, hate groups, and hate crimes. I have personally served in several roles in the government's national security apparatus, at the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, at the White House on the National Security Council, and now outside government on the front lines of combating anti-Semitism and all forms of bigotry at the ADL. In my testimony, I'd like to share with you some key data, findings, analysis, and urge this committee to take action to counter a severe national security threat, the threat of online white supremacist extremism that threatens our communities. The alleged El Paso shooter posted a manifesto to 8chan prior to the attack. He expressed support for the accused shooter in Christchurch, New Zealand, who also posted on 8chan. Before the massacre in Poway, California, the alleged shooter posted a link to his manifesto on 8chan, citing the terrorists in New Zealand and in the Pittsburgh Tree of Life attack. Three killing sprees, three white supremacist manifestos. One targeted Muslims, another targeted Jews, and a third targeted Latinx and other immigrant communities. One thing these three killers had in common was 8chan, an online platform that has become the go-to for many bigots and extremists. Unfettered access to online platforms, both fringe and mainstream, has significantly driven the scale, speed, and effectiveness of these forms of extremist attacks. Our ADL research shows that domestic extremist violence is trending up, and that anti-Semitic hate is trending up. The FBI and DOJ data show similar trends. The online environment today amplifies hateful voices worldwide and facilitates the coordination, recruitment, and propaganda that fuels the extremism that terrorizes our communities, all of our communities. 
whether through government, the private sector, or civil society, immediate action is paramount to prevent the next tragedy that could take innocent lives. ADL has worked with the platforms represented on this table to try to address that hate and its rampant nature online. We have been part of the conversations to improve the terms of service, content moderation programs, and better support for those individuals experiencing hate and harassment on those platforms. We appreciate this work greatly, but much more needs to be done. ADL has called on these companies at this hearing, as well as many others, to be far more transparent about the prevalence and nature of hate on their platforms. We need meaningful transparency to give actionable information to policymakers and stakeholders. But the growth of hate and extremist violence will not be solved by addressing these issues online alone. We urge this committee to take immediate action. First, our nation's leaders must clearly and forcefully call out bigotry in all its forms at every opportunity. Our nation's law enforcement leadership must make enforcing hate crimes laws a top priority. Our communities need this Congress's immediate action on a range of ways, notably to codify federal offices, to address domestic terrorism and extremism, and create transparent and comprehensive reporting, such as that required in the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act and similar measures in the Domestic Terrorism Data Act. Our federal legal system currently lacks the means to prosecute a white supremacist terrorist as a terrorist. Congress should explore whether it is possible to craft a rights-protecting domestic terrorism statute. Any statute that Congress should consider would need to include specific, careful, congressional and civil liberties oversight to ensure the spirit of such protections is faithfully executed. In addition, the State Department should examine whether certain foreign white supremacist groups meet the criteria for designation of FTO or foreign terrorist organizations. For technology and social media companies, we look forward to companies expanding their terms of service and exploring accountability and governance challenges, aspiring to greater transparency and how you address these issues, and partnering with civil society groups to help in all of these efforts. ADL stands ready, both with the government and the private sector, to better address all forms and threats online. This is an all-hands-on-deck moment to protect all of our communities. I look forward to your questions, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and other distinguished members of this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saleem. Uh, to Ms. Bickert, Mr. Pickles, and, and Mr. Slater, um, on your platforms, how do you define violent content? How do you define extreme content, Ms. Bickert? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we will remove any content that celebrates a violent act, and this is a serious physical injury or death of uh, another person. We also will remove any organization that is, uh, has proclaimed a violent mission or is engaged in acts of violence. We also don't allow anybody who has um, engaged in organized hate to have a presence on the site, and we remove hate speech. And hate speech we define as an attack on a person based on his or her characteristics like race, religion, sexual orientation, gender. We list them out in our policies. Um, harder to define extreme than, than violent, isn't that correct? Uh, yes, and, and we see different people use that word in different ways, Senator. So what we do is any organization that has proclaimed a violent mission or engaged in documented acts of violence, we remove them. It doesn't matter what the reason is for the violence. We just don't allow the violence, period. Mr. Pickles, what, what is your, your uh, platform's definition of extreme? So, so we, uh, similarly to Facebook, um, agree that the, the word extremism itself um, is very subjective and in some contexts can be a positive thing. People have extremely, be extremely active on an issue and in itself isn't a bad thing. Um, so we have a three-stage test that defines violent extremist groups um, and that, that test is that we identify through their stated purpose, publications or actions as extremist, then engage in violence, so they actually may currently be involved in violence presently, or they promote violence as a means to further their cause, um, and they target civilians. So we've got that three-stage test of both the, the ideology and the violence, because we believe that that framing allows us to protect speech and to protect debate, but also remove violent extremists from our platform. We then have a broader framework that prohibits, for example, threats of violence 
call for harm, a wish of harm against people that's much broader and, again, not dependent on ideology. M Mr. Slater, can you add any nuances to uh, what has uh, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, broadly similar in that we ban foreign, designated foreign terrorist organizations from using our platform, as well as incitement to violence, glorification of violence, encouragement to violence, and, uh, of course, hate speech. So broadly, similar lines. Now, uh, Mr. Salim has suggested that your uh, three um, platforms need to be more transparent. Uh, what do you say to that, Mr. Slater? Thank you, Chairman. And, and I think um, transparency is a uh, bedrock of the work we do, particularly around online content. I try and help people understand both what the rules are and how we are enforcing them. It's something we need to continue to get better at. I um, look forward to working with this committee and Mr. Salim and others on that. We have, in the last year on YouTube, uh, provided our YouTube Community Guidelines Enforcement Report, where you can go and see how many videos we removed in a quarter, for what reasons, which were flagged by machines versus users, and we break that down by violent extremism, hate speech, child safety, and other issues. Uh, so I think this is a really key issue, and we look forward to continuing to improve. Mr. Salim, before I, I ask Ms. Bickert and Mr. Pickles to respond, um, perhaps you could help them understand how in you frankly don't believe they're quite transparent enough at this point. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your question. T to be clear, the point I'm making on transparency is to make sure that there are more clearly delineated categories between the point that Mr. Slater was making in terms of what the machines or the algorithms use to remove uh, certain types of content or stop it from going up in the first place and what users on any of these platforms uh, go on to say, like, we think this is a violation of the terms of service. There is degrees of inconsistencies um, across these platforms that are at the table as well as others. And so to get a, a holistic picture of what a certain issue may be um, while individuals may flag versus what some algorithms pull down, there, there are different consistencies in that. And so when we're asking for transparency, we're really looking for a, a much more balanced approach um, in that across all the platforms. Mr. Pickles, is he uh, touching on something that, uh, that has a point? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the balance between, particularly for, for companies who are investing in technology, understanding what came down because a person saw it and reported it versus did the content come down because technology found it is very important. Um, we now publish a breakdown of six policy areas and the number of user reports we receive is about 11 million reports every year. But 40% of the content that we remove, we remove because technology found it, not because of user reports. 40%. Yeah, so we're trying, so telling that story in a meaningful way is absolutely a challenge uh, and one that we're certainly investing in. What's that percentage um, in Facebook, Ms. Baker? Mr. Chairman, when it comes to violent content uh, and terror content, more than 99% of what we remove is flagged by our technical tools. And we've had a productive... By artificial intelligence. Some of it's artificial intelligence. Some of it is image matching. So known uh, videos where we use a software to reduce that to basically a digital fingerprint and we're able to, to stop uploads of that video again. We've worked with ADL for, for years on uh, this, and I think transparency is key. I think we'd all agree. We, for the past year and a half, have published not only our detailed implementation guidelines for exactly how we define hate speech and, and violence, but also reports on exactly how much we're removing in each category and how much of that, like Mr. Pickle said, how much of it is actually flagged by our technical tools before we get user reports. Thank you very much. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Salim, um, I think you mentioned 8chan, but what, what do you think we need to do to monitor incitement on 8chan and other dark websites? So I think, I think you can really approach this issue from two categories. There are a number of increased measures, some of which I noted in my uh, written statement submitted to this committee, um, that these companies as well as others can take to create a, a greater degree of transparency and standards so that we can have a really accurate measure um, of the types of hatred and bigotry that exists in the online environment writ large. And a result of that increased or, or better data, we can make better policies that apply to content moderation, terms of service, et cetera. So I think really having the good, the good data is a framework for better policies and better applications and content moderation programs. So you're saying there's more that they can do? I think Social media companies, there's more they can do. 
Yes, ma'am. There's much more that can I be mean, done. I mean, I look in your statement about the you would include auditing and you know third party evaluation. So for that transparency as well as uh, you know responsibility. But as I mentioned in my opening statement, you don't want to basically then drive all of this to a dark web that we have less access to. I'm going to get to them and ask them a question. But what more do you think we should be doing? together to address the uh, hate that is taking place on these darker websites too? So a, n a number of measures. I mean, the first is having our public policy be very, starting from a place where we're victim focused. We know that whether it's Pittsburgh, Poway, El Paso, or any of the number of cities that, that uh, uh, other panelists and, and members of this committee have mentioned in their statements, we need to start to make measures that combat extremism or domestic terrorism be from preventing other such horrific tragedies. And in order to do that, we really need to start from a place that prevents and has a better accounting of hate crimes, bias-motivated crimes, hate-related incidents, et cetera. And when we start from that place, um, I think we can make better policy and better programs at the, at the federal government and state and local and also in the private industry levels as well. Well, one of the reasons I'm definitely going to be you know, calling on Department of Justice to ask what more we can do in this coordination is several years ago, Interpol, Microsoft, others worked on trying to address on an international basis child pornography to better skill law enforcement at policing crime scenes online. And I would assume that uh, the representatives today would be uh, supportive, maybe helpful, maybe even financially helpful in trying to address these crimes as they exist today as hate crimes on the dark side of the web. Is that, do I have any responses from our tech companies here? Thank you, Senator Cantwell. This is something that across the industry we've been working on for the past few years in a manner very similar to how the industry came together against child exploitation online. We launched the global uh, GIFCT, the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, which both of my colleagues referred to as a way of getting industry to create sort of a no-go zone for this uh, terrorist and, and violent content. As part of that, we train hundreds of smaller companies on best practices and we make technology available to them. The reality is for the bigger companies, we often are able to build technical tools that will stop videos at the time of upload. It's much harder for smaller companies, which is why we provide technology to them. We now have 14 companies that are involved in a hash sharing consortium so that we can um, help even these small companies stop terrorist content at the time of upload. Well, I, I appreciate and agree with Mr. Slim. There is more that you can do <laughs> on your own sites. But setting that aside for a minute, what do you think we should do about 8chan and the dark websites? What, are, what do you all think we should do? I can tell you what we do on Facebook, Senator, which is we ban any link that uh, connects to 8chan poll where these manifestos have appeared. So those manifestos uh, with the El Paso shooting, with Poway, were not available through Facebook. I'm saying what more do you think in government and law enforcement working together besides what you do to address this? Anybody else, Mr. Pickles? Or? Well, I, I think to, to, pick, to follow up on Mr. Salim's point, I think certainly if there's criminal activity happening on these platforms, then a law enforcement response is primary. Um, as I say, at the tools we have in our toolbox are related to content. Um, if people are promoting violence against individuals and are committing criminal offences, a law enforcement intervention at that point um, is something I think should be looked at. And I think um, if we can strengthen as industry our cooperation with law enforcement, we can make sure that, that the, the information sharing is as strong as it needs to be to support those interventions. So you think we need more law enforcement resources addressing this issue? I think it's a question of both resources, and I think, again, to follow Mr. Salim's point, uh, there was a paper from uh, George Washington University uh, last week looking at the statutory framework around some of these spaces, and if there are opportunities to strengthen them um, in, in many of the areas Mr. Salim mentioned, uh, again, I think that's a, a worthwhile public policy conversation to have. Well, I, I definitely believe you need more law enforcement resources on this issue. When I look at what progress we made with Interpol and the tech industry fighting on other issues. I think this is something, and I hear that from Mr. Slim, more resources. So thank you all very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cantwell. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In uh, June, Senator Thune held a subcommittee hearing on persuasive design, 
And as we discussed, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube are engineered to track, capture, and to keep our attention. Whether it's through predictions of the next video to keep us watching, or what content to push to the top of our news feeds. I think we have to realize that when social media platforms fail to block extremist content online, this content doesn't just slip through the cracks. It's amplified, and it's amplified to a wider audience. And we saw those effects during the Christchurch shooting. The New Zealand terrorist Facebook Live broadcast was up for an hour. That was confirmed by the Wall Street Journal before it was removed, and it gained thousands of views during that time frame. Ms. Bickert, how do you concentrate on the increased risk from how your algorithms boost content while well, gaps still exist in getting dangerous content off the platform? You, you touched on that a little bit in your response to Senator Wickert, but how are you targeting solutions to address that specific tension that we see? Senator, thank you for the question. It's a real area of focus. And there are three things that we're doing. Probably uh, the most significant is technological improvements, which I'll come back to in a second. Second is making sure that we are staffed to very quickly review reports that come in. So the Christchurch video, once that was reported to us by law enforcement, we were able to re remove it within minutes. That response time is critical to stopping the, the virality you've mentioned. And finally, partnerships. We have hundreds of safety and civil um, society organizations that we partner with. So if they're seeing something, they can flag it for us through a special channel. Now, going back to the technology briefly, with the horrific Christchurch video, one of the challenges for us was that our artificial intelligence tools did not spot violence in the video. What we are doing going forward is working with law enforcement agencies, including in the US and the UK, to try to gather uh, videos that could be helpful training data for our technical tools. And that's just one of the many efforts we have to try to improve these machine learning technologies so that we can stop the next viral video at the time of upload, or at the time of creation. When, when you talk about working with law enforcement, you said law enforcement contacted you. Is that reciprocal? Do you, um, do you see something? Uh, show up and then you in turn try to get it to law enforcement as soon as possible so that uh, individuals can be identified? Uh, what's the working relationship there? Absolutely, Senator. We have a team uh, that is uh, our law enforcement outreach team. Anytime that we identify a credible threat of imminent harm, we will reach out proactively to law enforcement agencies and we do that regularly. Also, when there is some sort of mass violence incident, we reach out to them, even if we have no indication that our service is involved at all, we want to make sure the lines of communication are open, they know how to submit emergency process to us, we respond around the clock uh, in a very timely fashion because we know that every minute is critical in this type of situation. I'm a right. former prosecutor myself, and so I, these things are, uh, are, are very personal to me. I know that the platforms that are represented here today, you you have increased your efforts to take down this harmful content, but as we know, the, there's still sh shortfalls that exist in order to get that um, response made in a, in a, not just a timely manner, but one that's going to truly have an effect. Uh, Mr. Slater, when it, when it comes to liability, do media platforms, do you guys need more skin in the game? Um, so that you can ensure better accountability and uh, be able to incentivize some kind of timely solution? Thank you, Senator, for the question. I think if you look at the practices that we are all investing in, certainly looking from our perspective and the way we are getting better over time, the current legal framework strikes a, a reasonable balance. Uh, in particular, it both provides protection from liability that would go too far, that would be overbroad, but also act, acts as a, a sword, not just a shield, empowering us and giving us the legal certainty that we need to invest in these technologies, the people to monitor, or detect, review, and remove this sort of violative content. So I think that way the legal, the legal framework continues to work well. Mr. Sleem, can you con comment on this as well? Do you think there's enough um, legal motivation for social media platforms 
um, to prioritize some kind of solutions out there? I mean, that's what this hearing's about. It's to find uh, <clears throat> solutions so that we can curb that online hate that uh, I think continues to grow. When, when thinking through the issues of, of content moderation, the, the authorities um, that exists within the current legal frameworks that reside within the companies represented at this table is sufficient for them to take actions on issues of content moderation, transparency, reporting, et cetera. So there certainly is a, a, a degree of, uh, of legal authorities that affords uh, these companies as well as others the, the opportunity to take any number of measures. Ms. Bickard, in your testimony, you say that Facebook Live will ban a user for 30 days for a first time violation of its platform policies. Is, is that enough? Can users be banned uh, permanently? Is that, would that be um, something to, to look at? Senator, thank you for the question. One uh, serious violation will lead to a temporary removal of the ability to use live. However, if we see repeated serious violations, we simply take that person's accounts away. And that is something that uh, we do across the board, not just with hate and inciting content, but uh, other content as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Senator Blumenthal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, thank you for outlining the increased attention and intensity of effort that you are providing to this very profoundly significant area. I welcome that you're doing more and trying to do it better, but I would suggest that even more needs to be done and it needs to be better and you have the resources and technological capabilities to do more and better. And just to take uh, the question that Senator Fisher asked of you, Mr. Saleem, uh, about incentives, your answer was that they have authority to provide them with opportunities. The question is, really, don't they need more incentives to do more and do it better to prevent this kind of mass violence that may be spurred by hate speech appearing on the sites or, in fact, may actually be a signal of violence to come. And uh, I just want to highlight that 80% of all perpetrators of mass violence provide clear signals and signs that they are about to kill people. That is the reason that Senator Graham and I have a bipartisan measure to provide incentives to more states to adopt extreme risk protection order laws that will, in fact, give law enforcement the information they need to take guns away from people who are dangerous to themselves or others. And that information is so critically important to prevent mass violence, but also suicides, domestic violence, and the keys and information and signals often appear on the internet. In fact, just this past December in Monroe, Washington, a clearly troubled young man made a series of anti-Semitic rants and violent posts online. He bragged about planning to, quote, shoot up a expletive school, end quote, in a video while armed with an AR-15 style weapon and on Facebook posted that he was, quote, shooting for 30 Jews. Fortunately, the ADL saw that post. It went to the FBI, and the ADL's vigilance prevented another Parkland or Tree of Life attack. Fred Gutenberg of Coral Springs, Florida, met with me yesterday, told me about a similar incident involving a young man in Coral Springs who said he was about to shoot up the high school there, and law enforcement was able to foresaw it using an extreme risk protection order statute. So my question is to uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Google, what more can you do to make sure that these kinds of signs and signals involving references to guns, 
It may not be hate speech, but it's references to possible violence with guns or use of guns to make that available to law enforcement. Ms. Biggert and Mr. Pickle and Mr. Slater. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. One of the biggest things we can do is engage with law enforcement to find out what is working in our relationship and what isn't. And that's the dialogue that over the, the past years has led to us establishing um, a, a portal through which they can electronically submit requests for content with legal process and we can respond very quickly. We but do what are you doing them. proactively? And I apologize for interrupting, but my time is limited. Uh, proactively, what are you doing with the technology you have to identify the signs and signals that somebody's about to use a gun in a dangerous way, that someone is dangerous to himself or others and is about to use a gun? Senator, we are now using technology to try to identify any of those early signs, including gun violence, but also suicide or self-injury. And in, do you report it to law enforcement? We do. In, in 2018, we referred um, a number of uh, many cases of suicide or self-injury where we detected them using artificial intelligence to law enforcement so that they were able to then intervene and in many cases save lives. We have, a, we have a, is that a very similar approach where we have a credible threat that something, someone is at risk, um, either to others or themselves. We work with the FBI to, uh, to ensure they have the information they need. Mr. Slater. Thank you, Senator. Similarly, when we have a good faith belief of a credible threat, then we will proactively refer uh, to the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center, who will then fan that out to the right authorities. Because my time has expired, I'm going to ask each of you, if you would please, to give me more details in writing as a follow-up for how you use, what identification signs you use, what kind of te technology, and how you think it can be improved, assuming that the Congress approves, as I hope it will, the uh, emergency risk protection order statute to provide incentives more than just the 18 states that have them now, but others to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank all of you for being here today. Your participation in this hearing is appreciated as this committee continues its oversight of the difficult task each of your companies face, preserving an openness on your platforms while seeking to responsibly manage and thwart the actions of those who use your services to spread extremist and violent content. Last Congress, when we held a hearing looking at terrorist recruitment and propaganda online, we discussed the cross-sharing of information between Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, and YouTube, which allowed each of those companies to identify potential extremism faster and more efficiently. Um, so I would just direct this question and ask the, how effective has that shared da database of uh, hashes been? Senator Thune, thank you for the question. Through the uh, shared database, we now have more than 200,000 distinct hashes of terror propaganda. And that has allowed, I can speak for Facebook only, but that has allowed us at Facebook to uh, remove a lot more than we otherwise would have been able to do. I, I would just add, since that hearing, actually, I think the, the reassuring thing is that um, we don't just share hashes now. We've grown that partnership, so we share URLs. So if we see a link to a piece of content like a manifesto, we're able to share that across industry. And furthermore, I think an area that uh, after Christchurch we recognize we need to improve, we now have real-time communications in a crisis. So industry can talk to each other in real time, operationally, to say, even you know, not content related, but situational awareness, that partnership between industry now also involves law enforcement. That wasn't there when I think we had that hearing last. And so I think it's not just about the hash program, but broadening out new programs that are developing that work further. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think uh, broadly, I would say look at how we have been improving over time. Surely systems are not perfect. We're always going to have to evolve to deal with bad actors. But I think on the whole, we are doing a better and better job, in part because of this technology sharing, this information sharing, in removing this sort of content before it has a wide exposure of any sort, before it is viewed uh, widely. Senator, I, I would only add that the threat environment that we are in today as a country has changed and evolved in the past 24 to 36 months. And likewise, the, the, the tactics and techniques that, that these platforms, as well as others, use to evolve the, the evolving nature 
of the terrorist landscape online, whether it be foreign or domestic, uh, needs to keep pace with the threat environment that we are in today. And so just as a follow-up, are there similar partnerships among your companies as well as the smaller platforms to specifically identify uh, mass violence? Senator, one of the things that we've done over time is expand the mandate of the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism. So uh, we, we relatively recently expanded to include mass violent incidents and we are now sharing, both through our, our uh, crisis incident protocol and our hash sharing, we are sharing a broader variety of violent incidents. Okay. Uh, Mr. Slater, YouTube is, uh, YouTube's, I should say, automated recommendation system has come under criticism for potentially steering users toward increasingly violent content. And earlier this year, uh, I led a subcommittee hearing examining the use of persuasive technologies on internet platforms, algorithm transparency, and algorithmic content selection uh, I asked the witness that Google provided at that time for that hearing several specific questions for the record about YouTube that were not thoroughly answered. And I would just say that providing complete answers to questions members submit for the record is essential as we look to work together as partners to combat many of the issues discussed here today. So I'd like your commitment to provide thorough responses to any questions you might get for the record. Do I have that? Certainly, Senator, the best of our ability. Okay. In addition, I'd like to just explore the nexus between persuasive technologies and today's topic. Specifically, what percentage of YouTube video views are the result of YouTube automatically suggesting or playing another video after the user finishes watching a video? Senator, I don't have a specific statistic there, but I can say the purpose of our uh, Watch Next, our recommendation system, is to show people uh, videos that they may like that are similar to what they've watched before. At the same time, we do recognize this concern about recommendations for borderline content, that is content that maybe isn't removed but brushes right up against those lines. And we have introduced changes this year to reduce recommendations for those, for those sorts of borderline videos. Okay. Well, uh, if you could get the, the number, if you, I assume you have that somewhere, that, that, that's, that's got to be available and furnish it for the record. But So the question again is to, to ask you specifically, um, what is YouTube doing to address the risk that some of these features, which you, as you note, are pointing a user in the direction of increasingly violent content? Yes, that, and that change we made in January to reduce yeah. recommendations has been key. It's, and it's, it's still early days, but it's working well. We have reduced the views from those recommendations for that borderline content by 50% just since January. As those systems get better, we hope that that will improve and happy to discuss it further. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Thune. Uh, based on presence at the gavel, we next have Senator Blackburn, followed by Senator Scott. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank each of you for being here this morning and for uh, talking with us. This committee has looked at this issue on the algorithms and their utilization for some time, and we're going to continue to do this. Looking at content and the extremist content that is online is certainly important. We know there are a host of solutions that are out there, and we need to come to an agreement and an understanding of how you're going to use these and these technologies to really protect our citizens. And social media companies are, in a sense, open public forums. And they should be where people can interact with one another. And part of your responsibility in this vein is to have an objective cop on the beat and be able to see what is happening because you're looking at it in real time. But what has unfortunately happened many times is you don't get an objective view, you don't get a consistent view, you get a subjective view. And this is problematic and it leads to confusion by the public that is using the virtual space for entertainment, for their transactional life, for uh, obtaining their news. So indeed, as we look at this issue, we are looking for you to approach it in a consistent and objective manner. And we welcome the opportunity to visit with you um, today. Ms. Bickert, I've got a couple of things that I wanted to talk with you about. Uh, 
we've all heard about these third party facilities where contractors are working long hours and they're looking at grotesque and violent images and they're doing this day in and day out. So talk a little bit about how you transition from that to using modern technologies, what Facebook is going to do in order to uh, capture this, to extract it and to minimize home harm. You've talked about You've got 30,000 employees that are working on safety and security. And then there are third party entities that are working on this. So let's talk about that impact on the individuals and then talk about the use of technologies to speed up this process and to make it more consistent and accurate. Thank you for the question, Senator. Making sure that we're enforcing our policies is a priority for us. Making sure that our content reviewers are healthy and safe in their jobs is paramount. And so one of the things that we do is we make sure that we are using technology to make their jobs easier and to limit the amount of content, types of content that they have to see. And I'll give you a couple examples. With child exploitation videos, with uh, graphic violence, with terror propaganda. We are now able to use technology to review a lot of that content so that people don't have to. And in situations okay, where now we can- Let me ask you this. Uh, sorry to interrupt, sure. but we need to move forward. Um, your 30,000 reviewers, are they all located in Palo Alto or are they scattered around the country or around the globe? Uh, no, Senator. The more than 50, we have 30,000 people working in safety and security. Some of them are engineers or lawyers. The content reviewers, we have more than 15,000. Okay. They are based around the world. Okay. All yes. Right. Great. Thank and, you. For and for any, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. For, for any of them, uh, not only are we using technology, and there are ways that we're using, even where we cannot um, make a decision on the content using technology alone, there are things we can do like removing the volume or separating a video into still frames that can make the experience better for the reviewer. Okay, now let me ask you about this. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg in a Washington Post op-ed had called for us to regulate, um, to define lawful but awful speech. So tell me how you think you could define or we could define lawful but awful speech but not um, overreach or infringe on somebody's First Amendment. Uh, free speech rights. Uh, Senator, one of the things that we're looking to uh, with our dialogue with governments is clarity on the actions that governments want us to take. So we have our set of policies that lays out very clearly how we define things, but we don't do that in a vacuum. We do that with a lot of input from civil society organizations and academics around the world, but we also like to hear the views from governments so we can make sure we are mindful of all of the different safety Well, ours are constitutionally based. I am out of time. Mr. Pickles, I'm going to submit a question to you for the record. Uh, Mr. Saleem, I've got one that I'm going to send to you. Mr. Slater, I uh, always have questions for Google, so you can depend on me to get one uh, to you, and we do hope that you all are addressing your prioritization issues also. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Senator Scott. Thank you for being here today. I'm glad we're having a, um, here today to have a meaningful conversation about what's happening in our nation. It's time we face the fact that our culture has produced an underclass of predominantly white young men who've placed no value on human life. These individuals live, live purposely, purposeless lives of anonymity and digital dependency, and increasingly act on the most evil desires, sometimes with racial hatred. As you all know, we had the, while I was governor, we had the horrible shooting at Parkland, at the school in Parkland. Uh, within three weeks, we passed historic legislation, including the risk protection orders that Senator Blumenthal was talking about. Uh, we did it by sitting down with law enforcement, mental health counselors, and, and educators to come up with the right solution. Now, with regard to the shooting at Parkland, the killer, Nicholas Cruz, had a long, long history of violent behavior. In September 2017, the FBI learned that someone with the username Nicholas Cruz had posted a comment on a YouTube video that said, I am going to be a professional sh school shooter. 
In addition, in addition Nicholas Cruz made, Cruz made other threatening uh, comments on various platforms. The individual who vid whose video Nicholas Cruz posted this comment on reported it to the FBI. Unfortunately, the FBI closed the investigation after 16 days without ever contacting Nicholas Cruz. The FBI claimed they were unable to identify the person who made the comment. Unfortunately, we now have 17 innocent lives that were lost because of Nicholas Cruz. My question is for Mr. Slater. How was a platform like YouTube, which is owned by Google, not able to track down the IP address and identity of the person who made that comment? When did YouTube remove the comment? Did YouTube report this comment to law enforcement? If so, who and when? If you did report this comment to law enforcement, did you follow up? What was the process? And was there any follow-up to see if there was any corrective action? Senator, thank you for the question. Um, first, uh, it was a horrendous event. And, you know, we strive to be vigilant, to invest heavily, to proactively report where we see an imminent threat. Um, I don't have the details on this, on the specific facts you're describing. I'd be happy to get back to you, but, but let me say this going forward. Looking ahead, Parkland was a moment that did spur us to proactively reach out to law enforcement to start talking about how can we do this better. And that's part of how we then reached out and started working more closely with the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center to make sure that when we did have these good faith beliefs, we could go to a one-stop shop who could get it to the right law enforcement uh, locally rather than us trying to cold call the right people. And this is something where just this month, in fact, or in the last month, there was an incident where uh, PBS was streaming the news hour on YouTube. Somebody put a threat in the live chat. Uh, we referred that to the Regional Intelligence Center. They referred it to Orlando police who then took uh, the person into custody uh, appropriately. And, and this was reported in the news. So that's not to say things are perfect. We always have to strive to get better, and I look forward to working with you and law enforcement on that. Uh, but I, I do think that we continue to improve over time. So with regard to Nicholas Cruz, you'll get me the, inf you'll get me the information of, you know, who did you contact, when did you contact, when was it taken down? Um, so so I've, I've, to this day, I cannot get an answer on what anybody did with regard to this, with this shooter. What, what YouTube did, what the FBI did, nobody wants to talk about it, which is fascinating to me. So if you'll give me that information, then second, second, are you comfortable that if, if another Nicholas Cruz puts something up, you have the process now that, that you'll contact somebody and there will be a follow-up process? Senator, I think uh, our processes are getting better all the time. They are robust. I think this is a, a area where it's an evolving challenge. Um, both because technology evolves, because people's tactics evolve, they might use code words and so on. But I'd be happy to follow up with the team and get more information on how those practices operate and how we continue to work together. Thank you. Mr. Pickles, how can, how can Nicholas Maduro, who is committing genocide against his citizens, who is withholding clean water, food, medicine, still have a Twitter account with 3.7 million followers? Well, you rightly highlight that the, the um, behaviour that's been taken there is abhorrent. And the question for us as a, a public company that provides a, a public space for dialogue is, is someone breaking our rules on our service? We recognise that there are situations where there are geopolitical circumstances, where there are world leaders who have Twitter accounts in countries where Twitter is blocked, where there is no free speech. And so we, we do take a view that that... The, the, we hope that the dialogue that that person being on the platform starts helps contribute to solving the challenges that you outline. But he's been doing it for a long time and there's, it's not getting better in Venezuela. It's getting worse. Uh, and I think this, this is a good, illust good illustration of how the role of technology companies along with other parts of public policy responses, um, if we removed that person's account, it would not change facts on the ground. And so we need to bear in mind how, how do the other levers Come into play. I completely disagree. Right. Maduro gets there and sits there and talk about uh, things uh, and continue to act like he's a world leader and he's a pariah. And it sure seems to me that what you're doing is allowing him to continue to do that. Well, as I say, he, he, his current account hasn't broken our rules. Were he to break our rules, he would be treated to the same rules as every other user and we would take action when necessary. 
Mr. Thank Chairman, you. I know that we have votes uh, already started and you're trying to get to other people. I, I'd be happy to work with the Senator of, from Florida on this issue. I do think that we're not doing enough, and uh, I think the specific case I mentioned in my opening statement about the Rohingya uh, and uh, what happened on Facebook is another example, so happy to work with you on this issue. Well, yes, and, and thank you, Senator Cantwell, and thank you, Senator Scott, for raising this. Um, I'm told there is a vote on, and um, I'm shocked, shocked to hear that they're going to leave it open till 1130, um, which is generally what happens. Uh, Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, while I do appreciate this committee's consideration of issues at the intersection of extremism and social media, Many, I think, would agree that today's hearing is another data point in a long history of congressional hand-wringing on gun violence. According to the Gun Violence Archive, since 2019 began 260 days ago, we have witnessed 318 mass shootings in the U.S., more than one per day. Mass shootings are those in which at least four people are shot, excluding the shooter. After 20 children, six adults, and the shooter lost their lives at Sandy Hook Elementary School in 2012, many elected officials, including myself, declared an end to congressional inaction. No more, we said. But since that day, our nation has endured 2,226 mass shootings. Think about that number for a minute. But here, we are not focused on ways to stop gun violence, but rather the scourge of social media. I'm not going to say that there's no connection. But every other country on the planet has social media, video games, online harassment, hate groups, crime, and mental health issues. But they don't have mass shootings like we do. Nothing highlights the absurdity of Congress's inability to solve the gun violence crisis than seeing 318 mass shootings in 260 days and then holding a hearing on extremism in social media. Ms. Bickert and Mr. Pickles. This is a chart from the Digital Marketing Institute that, according to their website, highlights the average number of hours that social media users spend on platforms like Facebook and Twitter. As you will see, the United States and the US, our users are relatively middle of the pack when it comes to time spent online. My question to you both is this. Do you agree that Americans' use of social media is not especially unique on a per capita basis? In other words, are you aware of specific trends on your platforms to explain the amount of gun violence in the United States? Senator Duckworth, and this won't come out of your time, so, uh, do sort of explain to us, uh, because some of us can't see the detail sure. there. This is how much time, average number of hours that social media users spend using social media each day via any device. And the arrow points it's to the United, United States. States. The highest is the Philippines, the lowest is Japan. The U.S. is right in the middle. So American users, and look, I've got a four and a half year old, and I have an 18 month old when I get home says, iPhone, iPhone, and she's on it. She knows how to select YouTube kids on my phone, and she knows how to go right to what she wants to watch. Okay. So I'm just as concerned, but the United States, in terms of social media usage, would you both agree is somewhere in the middle of the pack compared to the rest of the world? Uh, yes, Senator, according to the study, which I'm not more familiar with, mm -hmm. yes. Um, in other words, are you aware, either one of you aware of specific trends on your platforms to explain the amount of gun violence in the United States? Um, no, I think your, your study reflects um, our view. About 80% of our users are outside the United States. Uh, and so I think, I think your, uh, your image speaks for itself. Thank you. Mr. Salim, you brought up the role that video games can play in online hate and harassment. I agree with you that any dissemination of hate must be addressed regardless of the platform used. But if a meaningful connection between video games and gun violence exists, you think that the widespread use of video games in Japan and South Korea would reflect that connection, correct? If you look at this chart, I think there's something to be said for the availability of guns in the U.S. If you look in the amount of, the amount of time that the folks in Japan and South Korea spend um, on, on video games, it's far greater than anywhere else. We're, we're third, and yet if you look at the number instance of gun violence and gun deaths per every 100,000 people in 2017, here's the U.S. But we're not the biggest users of video games. Would this be accurate? 
Senator, thank you for your question. I, I have not read this specific study, but I, I do have one data point, if I may, to just share with you for just a moment. Um, according to an ADL report looking at extremist-related murders and homicides over the past decade, our research shows that 73 percent of extremist-related murders and homicides were, in fact, committed with firearms. So to the extent that, that you're making the point that um, extremists with weapons results in violence and homicide, um, we have the data that backs that point up. Thank you. As we're reminded daily, the world is full of individuals who use social media platforms to disparage others, cast false equivalencies, and question facts. Some will use the, the anonymity of online platforms to spread hate, but our use of social media, video games, and other variables does little to explain the 2,226 2, mass shootings since Sandy Hook. The internet has emboldened and empowered hate by allowing individuals to develop online communities and share their warped ideas. But it is our weak gun laws here in the U.S. that allows that hate to become lethal. There's a clear and undeniable connection between the number of guns in the United States and the number of gun deaths in our community. Look at this platform. This is the number of guns per 100 people, and this is the number of gun-related deaths per 100,000 people. We are up here. Here's the rest of the world, some of whom use more social media than we do, some of whom actually engage in more uh, uh, video games than we do. We are saturated in weaponry that was designed for war, but is made available to nearly anyone who attends a local gun show. The Dayton shooter had a 100-round drum. I didn't have a 100-round round drum when I served in Iraq. We didn't send Marines into Fallujah with 100-round drums, but yet you can buy them at gun shows. Look, 90% of Americans agree that Congress should expand background checks and red flag laws. 60% of Americans agree that banning high capacity ammunition clips is what we need to do. This is not controversial. It is well past time that Leader McConnell brings HR 8 to the House, the House passed Bipartisan Background Checks Act to the Senate floor for a vote. I hope Leader McConnell will also allow votes on the Keep Americans Safe Act, the Extreme Risk Protection Act, the Disarm Hate Act, and the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act. Each of these bills will keep our children and our neighbors safer. I hope my Republican colleagues will join in these bipartisan efforts. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, Senator Duckworth, let's do this um, so we can have a complete record. Uh, if, if you would um, reduce those three posters uh, to a size that we can copy, and they'll be admitted in the record at this point in the hearing without objection. Thank you very much, so Mr. Chairman. So ordered. It's Sen generous of you. Senator Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for being here today. I, I really do appreciate your testimony and um, uh, your answering our questions. Look, we all need to collaborate in, in curbing online extremism, which uh, I understand to be one of multiple causes uh, that we could cite uh, as, as we all think about the issue of, of mass casualty events and extremist uh, events more uh, generally. The nation's wrestling with uh, mass violence, extremism, and, and uh, issues of responsibility, digital responsibility uh, for, for some of these events. In fact, uh, in my home state of Indiana, Hoosiers in Crown Point, Indiana, recently experienced firsthand how a person can become radicalized over the internet, something I know that uh, many of your companies has, has studied and are working on. In 2016, a Crown Point man was arrested and convicted for planning a terrorist attack after becoming radicalized by ISIS over the internet. Thankfully, the FBI and the Indianapolis Joint Terrorism Task Force intervened before any violent attack occurred. However, that isn't always the case, as we know, as, and we've seen this across uh, the country. And, and that's why it's critically, critically important that we have this hearing, that we continue to work together collaboratively, knowing uh, that your products and platforms provide incredible value to consumers, and they obviously weren't intended for this purpose. So it's our responsibility in Congress. It is definitely your responsibility as, as business people uh, to make sure that we monitor how the great value that you provide can be used in an illicit, improper, dangerous, and nefarious manner. 
in one minute or less, because I have three minutes less left, uh, I, I would request that uh, the representatives from Google and Facebook and Twitter tell us why Americans should be confident that each of your companies is taking this issue seriously and why, why Americans should be optimistic about your efforts going forward. One minute each. Indeed. Yes. Google. Thank you, Senator. I, I would start by pointing to YouTube's Community Guidelines Enforcement Report, which details every quarter videos we've removed, the reasons why, and indeed how much has, is being flagged first by machines. Right. Uh, dealing with this issue, removing violative content, is a combination of technology and people. Technology can get better and better at identifying patterns. People can help deal with the right nuances. And we've seen over time that the technology is getting better and better at taking down the content faster and before people have viewed it. So as I said at the outset, of the 9 million videos that we removed in the second quarter of this year, 87% of those were first flagged by our machines. And 80% of those were removed before a single view. When we talk about violent extremism, it's generally better in terms of removal before wide viewing. So, you know, we are already seeing advancements in machine learning, not just in this area, but across the industry broadly. And the thing about machine learning as it is fed more data, as it learns from mistakes, as we say, oh, you got it wrong here, those systems will get better. And so why one should be optimistic is that those systems uh, ideally will continue to get better. Will they be perfect? No, bad actors will continue to evolve. But uh, I do think there is, there is reason for optimism, and I think there's reason for optimism uh, based on the collaboration between uh, all of us today. Thank you. Facebook. Thank you, Senator. The first thing I'll say is Facebook won't work as a service if it is not a safe place. And this is something that we are keenly aware of every day. If we want people to come together to build this community, they have to know they're safe. And so the incentives are there for us to make sure we are doing our part. Uh, one of the things that we have on our team of more than 350 people who are primarily dedicated in their jobs to countering terrorism and hate is uh, expertise. So you know, I, I lead this team. My background is with more than a decade as a federal criminal prosecutor. Safety and security are personal to me. But the people that I've hired onto this team have backgrounds in law enforcement, in uh, academia, studying terrorism and radicalization. This is something that people come to work on at Facebook because this is what they care about. They're not assigned to work on it while they're at Facebook. This is bringing in expertise, and, and I, I want to make that very clear. And then finally, similar to my colleagues here, we have taken steps to make what we're doing very transparent. The reports we've published in the past year and a half show a, a steady increase in our ability to detect terror, violence, and hate much earlier when it is uploaded to the site and before anybody reports it to us. Now more than 99% of the violent videos and the terrorist propaganda that we remove from the site, we are finding ourselves before anybody reports it to us. Thank you, Twitter. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think people can be optimistic. Um, a few years ago, at the, the peak of the Islamic Caliphate, so-called, um, people challenged our industry to do more, be better. Um, I now look at a time where 90% of the terrorist content that Twitter removes is detected through technology. I look at independent academics like Professor Moira Conway, who talk about the IS community being decimated on Twitter. I look at the collaboration that we have be between our companies which didn't exist when I joined Twitter five and a half years ago. All of those areas have driven better technology, faster response, and a much more aggressive posture towards bad actors that is now showing benefit in other areas. But I think we can also take confidence that no one is going to tell this committee our work is done, and that every one of us will leave here today knowing we have more to do, and we can never sleep. These actors are adversarial, and we have to keep adapting. Thank you so much. I could spend five days, five weeks, maybe five months or five years in this. I only had five minutes. I'm already one minute over, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Rosen. You're next. I'm going to go vote, and I can assure you I will not let them close that vote until you've asked your questions and get over there. Thank Senator you. Rosen. I appreciate it, Senator. Um, thank you for holding this important hearing. I want to thank all the witnesses for being here to talk about this very real and difficult issue. The rise of extreme on, extremism online is a serious threat 
and the Internet has unfortunately proven a valuable tool to extremists who are connecting with one another through various forms to spread hate and dangerous ideologies. While we're here to focus today on the proliferation of extremism online, which of course is incredibly important, we must not lose sight of the fact that violent individuals who find communities online to fuel their hatred have also acted in the name of hate. We cannot ignore the fact that the absence of sensible, common sense gun safety measures like background checks are allowing individuals to access dangerous weapons far too easily. And so we know the majority of Americans want us to support that. But I represent the great state of Nevada. And as we approach Unfortunately, the two-year anniversary of the one October shooting in Las Vegas, the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history, we know that coordination with and between law enforcement is more important than ever. The Southern Nevada Counterterrorism Center, also known as our Fusion Center, is an example of a dynamic partnership between 27 different law enforcement agencies to rapidly and accurately respond to terrorists and other threats. With Las Vegas hosting nearly 50 million tourists and visitors each year, the Fusion Center is responsible for preventing countless crimes and even acts of terrorism. So to all of you, can you please discuss with us your coordination efforts with law enforcement when violent or threatening content is identified on your platforms? And what do you need from us as a legislative body to promote and enable, facilitate whatever word you want to use to facilitate this partnership to keep our communities safe from another shooting like one October. Please. Thank you, Senator. That attack was incredibly tragic and our hearts are with those who have suffered and did suffer in that attack. Our relationship with law enforcement First is an ongoing uh, effort. We have a team that does trainings to make sure that law enforcement understand how they can best work with us. And that's something that we do proactively. Re we reach out and offer those. Anytime there is a mass violence incident, we reach out to law enforcement immediately, even if we're not aware of any connection between uh, our service and the incident. We want to make sure that they know where we are and how to reach us. We also have an online portal through which they can submit legal process, including emergency requests. And we have a team that that office is staffed 24 hours a day so that we can respond quickly. And finally, we proactively refer imminent threats of serious physical harm to law enforcement whenever we find them. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I, I just want to, to echo, firstly, Monica's sympathies for your constituents um, who were victims of that, that horrible tragedy. The, the lessons I think we have learned since that attack um, have continued to inform our thinking. Um, for example, not waiting for the ideological intent of the shooter to be known before acting. I think one of the challenges we have is the, in the traditional terrorist space, we might look for an organization affiliation before we would say this is a terrorist attack. We don't wait for that anymore. We act first to stop people using our services. As Monica said, we do cooperate with law enforcement um, to provide credible threats. I think one of the, the questions, and, and I, along with colleagues from other companies, actually met with a number of agencies mm. yesterday uh, to discuss how we can further deepen our collaboration and one of the questions we had there is, there's a huge amount of information within the law enforcement community, uh, within um, the DHS umbrella that is classified, that might help us understand the threats, the trends, the situational awareness. So understanding how more information can be shared with industry to better inform us about the threats so that we face. So can you provide us in writing some of the tools that you think you might need to help you better cooperate to protect our communities? Absolutely, and that, that was the, the subject of the meeting yesterday, and we had a very productive conversation. Thank you. Please. Senator, broadly similar here, both in horror and sympathy, tragedies like that one, and in the ways that we proactively cooperate with law enforcement, refer credible threats, as well as receive valid requests, emergency disclosure requests, respond to them expeditiously. Thank you. Um, I see my time is up. I'm going to submit a question for the record uh, about combating violence, violent anti-Semitism online. Uh, I know other people are waiting. We have votes. I appreciate your time and your commitment to solving and uh, working on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Your questions will be submitted for the record. I want to start with a, a simple 
Yes or no question. I don't mean this to be a trick. Yes or no question. Answer it easier. Either yes or no, or uh, yes or no with a, a brief one sentence caveat if you need to. Um, I'd like to hear from e each of the three of you, from, from uh, Ms. Bickert and then Mr. Pickles, then Mr. Slater. Do you provide a platform that you regard and present to the public as neutral in the political sense? Yes, Senator, our, our rules are politically neutral and we uh, apply them neutrally. And so you aspire to political neutrality as to left versus right? We want to be a, a service for political ideas across the spectrum. Okay. Mr. Pickles? Uh, we, we enforce our rules impartially and our rules are crafted without ideology uh, being included. Mr. Slater? Similarly, we uh, craft our services without regard to political ideology, though, as we've discussed today, we're not neutral against like, terrorism or violent sure. extremism or sure. hate speech. Yeah, and um, uh, I appreciate you pointing that out. I, th that is, of course, not uh, what I'm talking about. And that leads into the next question I wanted to raise with each of you. Um, I think it's important. Um, uh, the work each of you are doing in this area is, is important. It's important for anyone occupying this space to be uh, conscious of those things. You, uh, you do a service to, your, uh, to those who access your services by removing things like uh, pornography, um, uh, uh, terrorism advocacy, and things like that. Um, there's a, a lot of debate that surrounds this issue and surrounds some of the legal framework surrounding it. Um, as you know, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act has received a lot of criticism. It protects a website from being held liable as a publisher of information uh, by another information content provider. Uh, and significantly, Section uh, 230's Good Samaritan provision gives you the promise that you won't be held liable for taking down uh, this type of objectionable content that we're talking about, whether it's, whether it's something that's constitutionally protected or not. And so for, for each of the, uh, uh, of the same witnesses, again, I'd ask you, each of you represents a, a private company. Um, and each of you are accountable to your consumers uh, within your company. And this means that, in some sense, that you have incentives to provide a safe and enjoyable experience on your respective platform. Um, so I've got a question about Section 230. Do, does Section 230 particularly the Good Samaritan provisions, uh, help you in your efforts to swiftly take down things like pornography and terrorist content off your platforms? And would it be more difficult without the legal certainty that Section 230 provides? Absolutely, Senator. Section 230 is critical to our efforts in safety and security. Mr. Biggles? Absolutely, and I'd, I'd go further and say that Section 230 has been critical to the leadership of American industry in the information technology sector. Mr. Slater? Absolutely, yes. On a related point, imagine a world where this is suddenly taken away, where those provisions no longer exist. Large companies like yours might be able to, in fact, I strongly suspect still would be able to and still probably would filter out this content between the uh, artificial intelligence uh, capabilities at your disposal and your, uh, uh, the human resources that you have. I suspect you could and probably would still do your best to perform the same function. What about a startup? What about a company trying to enter into the space that each of your companies entered into when they were created not very many years ago? What would happen to them? Ms. Bickert? Senator, thank you for that question. This reminds me of uh, industry conversations involving smaller companies back before we formed the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism in uh, June of 2017. We were having closed door sessions with uh, companies large and small to talk about the best ways to combat the, the threat of terrorism online. And the smaller companies were very concerned about liability. Section 230 is very important for them to be able to begin to proactively act and assess content. I'd say it's, it's a fundamental part of maintaining a competitive online ecosystem, and without it, the ecosystem is less competitive. Mr. Slater? Yes, and I'd just add, the U.S. has Section 230, and that's part of the reason why we have been a leader in economic growth and innovation and technological development. Other countries that don't have something like it, 
uh, suffer, and study after study has showed that, and we'd be happy to discuss that more. If it were to be taken away, so your, all three of your companies, yours in particular, Mr. Slater, n not exactly known for being a small business uh, or, or a business with a modest economic impact. Um, it, it, you can identify, I assume, with this concern I'm uh, expressing. Uh, if we were to take that away, Google might be able to keep up with what it needs to do, but wouldn't it be harder for someone to start, say, a new search engine com company, a new tech platform of one sort or another, uh, somebody starting out in the same position where your company was a couple of decades ago, wouldn't that be exponentially more difficult? I think it would create problems for innovators of all stripes, but certainly small and medium-sized businesses uh, would have a lot, a lot of trouble potentially getting their arms around that sort of significant change uh, to the fundamental legal framework of the Internet. Uh, thank you. I see my time's expired. Senator Baldwin. Thank you. I wanted to begin by uh, thanking our full committee chairman, uh, Wicker, for holding uh, this hearing. I think it's a vital conversation for us to be having. Um, we need to be uh, taking a hard look at how we address the rising tide of online extremism and its real-world consequences in our country. Um, I do have uh, some questions for you on uh, this important topic, but first I wanted to echo some um, of what my colleagues have already said, um, which is there is much more that the Senate must do to address gun violence, whether or not it's connected to hatred espoused on the Internet. So more than 200 days ago, the House of Representatives um, passed uh, a bipartisan universal background check bill. And this common, gun safety, common sense gun safety measure has an extraordinary level of public support. Um, it deserves a vote on the Senate floor, and I feel like we can't simply have hearings, but we have to act to reduce gun violence. Um, Mr. Salim, uh, ADL's Center on Extremism has closely studied hate crimes and extremist violence in this country. Is it fair to say that there has been um, an alarming increase in bias-motivated crimes, including extremist killings, in the last several years? Yes, Senator, that's accurate. Um, in the case of extremist killings, what role do you feel that access to firearms has played in that increase? Senator, thank you for that question. As I, I briefly alluded to earlier, just to expand on, on what I was mentioning, According to our recent ADL report, extremists of all ideological spectrums um, that committed murders or homicides in the United States, 73% of those acts were committed with firearms. Thank you. What impact do you believe this increase in hate crimes, including extremist killings, have on the minority communities whose members have been the targets of these attacks? And let me just add to that question, one of the unique aspects of a hate crime is that it now not only victimizes the targeted victim, but um, it strikes fear among those who share the same characteristics with the victim or victims. S Senator, thank you for making this point. In the past 24 months, we saw a calendar year 2017 with a 57 percent increase of anti-Semitic incidents across the country. The FBI and DOJ's own hate crime data showed a 17 percent increase in hate crimes and bias-motivated crimes in calendar year 17. We continue to see these troubling statistics year after year, and so it's imperative, and part of my testimony today, both the, the submitted written and my oral testimony, speaks to the need for greater enhancement and enforcement of hate crime laws and protections for victims. I'm an original co-sponsor of Senator uh, Bob Casey's legislation, the Disarm Hate Crime uh, Hate Act, which would bar those convicted of misdemeanor hate crimes from obtaining firearms. Do you agree that this measure could help keep guns out of the hands of individuals who might engage in extremist violence? Yes, Senator. Thank you for your leadership um, and all members who have supported this legislation. ADL supports this legislation. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the efforts that our witnesses from the social media companies um, have described regarding their company's efforts to combat online extremism, including to provide some transparency to their users and the general public. 
it's of course critically important to understand how you're addressing problems within your existing services and platforms. I'd actually like to learn more from you about how you are thinking about this issue as you develop and introduce new products. In other words, I think a lot of us uh, feel uh, that the approach of rapidly introducing a new product um, and then assessing the consequences later uh, is, um, uh, is a problem. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to uh, ask you, how do you plan to build combating extremism into the next generation of ways in which individuals engage online? And why don't we start with you, Ms. Bigger? Thank you for the question, Senator. Safety by design is an important part of building new products at our company. One of the things uh, we've built in the past maybe five years is a new products policy team that sits under me. Their responsibility is to make sure they're aware of new products and features that are being built and explaining to these uh, engineers who are thinking of all the wonderful ways that the service could be used all of the abuse scenarios that we could also envision and making sure that we have reporting mechanisms or other safety features in place. I think, as I said earlier, um, we are in a very adversarial space. We know that bad actors will change their behavior. And so every time we have a, a feature, um, a policy decision, one of the key processes in that part of the discussion is how can this be used against us? How can this be gamed? How will people change their behavior to try and circumvent the policy? And that, I think you're absolutely right. We did need to take that learning and share that with smaller companies. So certainly the work that GIFCT's done, uh, working with more than, I think, 200 small companies around the world to share that knowledge with them, to help them understand the challenges, is also invaluable. Similarly, our trust and safety teams are at the table with product managers and engineers from the conception of an idea all the way through the development and possible release. So from, from ground up, it's safety by design. Thank you. Well, so I want to thank the witnesses, and I'm going to be taken over as a chair, and I will call on myself as the next witness. Um, I want to actually ask all of you, um, you know, your, your companies, your technology are famous for its algorithms, which seem to have the ability to pinpoint on what people want. You know, you can put an email out, or even some people think, talk about, say, your interest in yellow sweaters, and... Next thing you know, you have ads popping up on your Facebook or other accounts that talk about yellow sweaters. Who knows uh, how that happens, but to a lot of us, it happens. It's pretty impressive. But here's my question. If, if your algorithm technology is so good at kind of pinpointing things like that, what people are interested in, particularly as it relates to ads, what are the challenges with regard to directing that kind of technology to help us and help you find what is been talked about here on both sides of the aisle, which is the people who are committing this kind of violence are typically disaffected young males. And aren't there signs, aren't there things that you can do with the technology that you do so well in other spaces to, to at least provide more warning signs of this kind of violence from these kind of individuals who in some ways already have a profile online. I'll throw that out to any of you. And are you working on that? Thank you for the question, Senator. Technology plays a huge role in what we are doing to enforce our safety policies at Facebook. In the area of terrorism, extremism, and violence, it's not just the uh, matching softwares that we have to stop things like organized terror propaganda videos. We are now using artificial intelligence, machine learning, to get better at identifying new content that we haven't seen before that might be promoting violence or uh, trying to incite violence or engage in other harmful behavior. Anytime that we find a credible threat of imminent physical harm, we proactively send that to law enforcement. And these systems are getting better every day. And are you using the algorithms and the advanced technologies that you use in other spaces to help identify the, those threats? Uh, there's certainly cross-learnings across the company. There, different products work in, in different ways. But, but is, um, a, is it a priority of yours, the way it would be for selling yellow sweaters? Oh, absolutely. And, and this is something that we and do. Can I, say, can I ask that of all the companies here? 
absolutely investing in technology to find content that, that is terrorist content, violent extremist content is absolutely a priority. It is a top priority, yes. Senator, I, I would only add to this part of the conversation as someone who studied the research and the data around these issues for, for nearly two decades, th the threat environment that we're in today has changed significantly. White supremacist terrorists in the United States don't have training camps in the same way that, that foreign terrorist groups do, like Al-Qaeda or ISIS or others. Their training camp, where they connect, learn, and coordinate with one another, is in the online space. So it's imperative that the question you're asking about the machine learning, the technology, the artificial intelligence, continue to advance to disrupt that environment and make it an uh, inhospitable place for individuals that, that want to promote violent content of any ideological spectrum to be disrupted. Let me ask another question. This is kind of a bigger kind of policy question, but you, all of your companies kind of have this tension between you want eyeballs on, right? You want more clicks, you want more time on, and yet with, with uh, Facebook or Google or Twitter, and yet there, I think there's increasing studies that are showing, for example, the amount of young men and women, uh, young girls, who feel kind of a sense of loneliness from their time online. Um, you know, there's indications that among teenagers, uh, suicide rates are increasing, particularly for uh, young girls. One of the things that I worry about, you know, we're all dealing with this opioid epidemic right now, and we're looking back going, my God, how did we, how did we do that? How did we get to this position in the 90s and with policies and other things that, you know, 72,000 Americans died of overdoses last year? And so we're kind of looking backwards saying, how did this happen? Do you, in your kind of C-suites of... Uh, policy making, do you ever wonder, are we going to be looking back in 20 years going, how in the hell did we addict a bunch of young Americans to look at their damn iPhones eight hours a day in 20 years from now, we're going to be seeing the social and physical and psychological ramifications where we all might be kicking ourselves in the head saying, why did we allow that to happen? Do you guys ever think about that? Because I think about that and it worries me, but you have tension because you want don't you want more face time? Don't you want young teenagers spending seven hours a day staring at their iPhones because that helps your revenues? Do you worry that 15, 20 years from now we're going to be in the same spot that we are with opioids and saying, what did we do to our kids? What did we do to our citizens? Any of you guys worry about that? Your power, your, your negative implications of what's happening in society right now. Senator, thank you for the question. As a mother, I, I take these questions about wellness very seriously, and our company does as well. And this is something that uh, we look at and we talk to youth wellness groups to make sure that we are uh, crafting products and policies that are in the best long-term interests of the people who want to come and connect through Facebook. I also want to say that um, we have seen social media be a tremendous place for support for those who are thinking of harming themselves or struggling with eating disorders or opioid addiction uh, or getting uh, exposed to hateful content. And so we're also exploring and developing ways of linking people up with help resources. We already do that now for opioid addiction, um, for thoughts of self-harm, for um, uh, people who are asking or searching for hateful content, we now provide them with help resources. We do think that this can be a really positive thing for overall wellness. Um, I just add, we, we have similar programs in place for both opioid um, searches and also for people who are using terms referencing self-harm or suicide, where we will provide, intervene and provide them with a source of support. Um, and that's something we've rolled out around the world. I think the other thing is um, we certainly recognize that things like digital literacy are issues that we as industry and certainly we as Twitter need to invest in to make sure that as people are using our services, they also have the skills and the, the awareness to use them uh, discerningly. And then finally, um, our CEO has committed the company to looking at the health of the conversation and not just using the kind of metrics that you've referenced, but looking at much more broader uh, metrics that measure the, the health of the conversation rather than just revenue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Senator Cruz. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I will say thank you to my friend from Alaska for sharing, apparently, this, this deep void and longing in your heart. And I just want to reassure you, for Christmas, you will be getting that yellow sweater. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Slater, I want to start, start with you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Project Dragonfly. In August of 2018, it was reported that Google was developing a censored search engine under the alias of Project Dragonfly. In response to those concerns, Alphabet shareholders requested that the comp company publish a human rights impact assessment by October 30th of this year examining the actual and potential impacts of censored Google search in China. However, during Alphabet's shareholder meeting on June 19th, the proposal for the assessment was rejected. In fact, Alphabet's board of directors explicitly encouraged shareholders to vote against the proposal. And Alphabet commented that, quote, Google has been open about its desire to increase its ability to serve users in China and other countries. We have considered a variety of options for how to offer services in China in a way that is consistent with our mission and have gradually expanded our offerings to consumers in China. So, so, so I want to start with just some clarity. Mr. Slater, has Google ceased any and all development and work on Project Dragonfly? Uh, Senator, to my knowledge, yes. Uh, and has Google committed to foregoing future project, projects that may, may, may be named differently but would be focused on developing a censored search engine in China? Senator, we have nothing uh, to announce at this time, and I think wh whatever we would do, we would look very carefully at things like human rights. In fact, we work with the Global Network Initiative uh, on an ongoing basis to evaluate how our uh, principles, our practices, our products uh, comport with human rights in the law. So roughly contemporaneously, uh, Google decided that it didn't want to work with the U.S. Department of Defense. How does Google justify having been willing to work with the Chinese government on complex projects, including artificial intelligence, uh, under Project Maven, and at the same time not being willing to help the Department of Defense developed ways to minimize civilian casualties through better AI. How do you, how do you reconcile those, those, those two approaches? Senator, as we've talked about today, we do partner with law enforcement and we do partner with the military in certain ways, offering uh, some of our services. Also as a business, we draw responsible lines about where we want to be in business, including limitations on in getting into the field of building weapons and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, we will continue to evaluate that over time. Let me shift to a different topic, which is this panel has talked about combating extremism and the efforts of social media to do that. Um, many Americans, including myself, have a longstanding concern that when big tech says it's combating extremism, that that is often a shield for advancing political censorship. Uh, Mr. Pickles, I want to talk about recently, uh, Twitter extended its pattern of censorship to the level that it took down the Twitter account uh, of the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell. Um, that I found a pretty remarkable thing for Twitter to do, and it, and it did so because that account, as I understand it, had sent out a video of angry protesters outside of Senator McConnell's house, uh, including uh, an organizer of Black Lives Matter in Louisville who s heard in the video uh, saying that, that the Senate Majority Leader, quote, should have broken his little raggedy, wrinkled ass neck. And someone else who had a voodoo doll of the majority leader, and another angry protester said, just stab the MF's heart, although that person did not abbreviate MF. Um, 
Senate Majority Leader sent out those threats of violence and found, rather remarkably, his own Twitter account taken down. How, how does Twitter explain that? Well, thank you, Senator, for the opportunity to discuss this. Um, something we've been asked around the world is the climate in many political jurisdictions of safety of people who hold public office. And so when we saw a video posted by numerous users um, that clearly identified someone's home and clearly contained, as you, as you reference, some quite severe threats, out of an abundance of caution, we did remove that video. We didn't remove the accounts. We removed that single tweet that contained the video from everybody who had posted it because the, the, the essence of a video with someone's personal home where the Senate Majority Leader uh, may have been residing at the time with several violent references, we felt was something out of an abundance of caution we should remove. We then discussed this further with the Leader's office. Uh, we understood their intent was to call attention to those very threats of violence. And so we, we did permit the video to be put on Twitter with a warning message saying this is sensitive media. But it's, it's that balance that we're striking between I've been in many different situations where I've been asked the exact opposite, which is similar content should be removed because it contains a clear violent threat. And that balance is something that we, we strive to, uh, to get right every day. But our first thought in that instance was the safety uh, of Leader McConnell and his family. You would agree there's a difference between someone posting video where they are threatening someone else and the target of that threat po posting the video. You would agree that those are qualitatively different? I, I think that's wholly fair, but I think in the situation where you have the person's home visible in the video, there is still a risk there. And we, we are motivated by preventing that offline harm that could have occurred because the home was visible. It was, it was a hard call. And we appreciated the leader's discussion, uh, discussing with his, his campaign team and his, uh, his Senate office. Um, and we appreciated their insight. But this was something that our motivation was to prevent harm, um, not the, uh, the kind of potentially ideological issues that you may allude to. Thank you. Uh, but Mr. Pickles, um, Have you rethought your policy since the instance that Senator Cruz asked about? And I would call your attention to Ms. Bickert's testimony, written testimony on page two, which says, and I quote, we do not allow propaganda or symbols that represent any of these organizations or individuals to be shared on our platform unless they're being used to condemn or inform. Um, is, is that language instructive to your platform? And don't you think that clearly it was readily evident from the beginning that Senator McConnell and his campaign had posted that video to condemn and inform? I think this is, this is an absolutely relevant issue. We as a company um, have taken a more aggressive posture. After the Christchurch attack, we did see people posting both excerpts of the manifesto and content of the video to condemn it. And we decided even in those circumstances, we would remove it. Um, for other attacks more recently in the United States, where images have been posted to, of manifestos, with large chunks of manifestos, even where they are condemning it, we have taken the decision to remove that material. So this is something that is, is constantly under tension, and I think the case you illustrate highlights for us the complexity in getting this right. But again, if we're going to, if we're going to err on the side of caution, fewer violent threats and fewer people's homes being visible on our platform is notably a good thing. We have to work harder at taking into account the kind of context you outline, but this is something where, this is the first time I, and I've been with the company five and a half years, I've ever been asked, um, why didn't we leave something up that contained a violent threat? And so I think, that in itself is illustrative of the complexity of the situation. Well, in terms of the context, in this instance, it was the owner of the home who chose to inform the world about what was being said against him. And it was the uh, individual himself who posted this. And it, it, uh, it seems to be a clear-cut case in, in that instance that differentiates it from the condemnation of, of the, the larger 
incident of the of the Christchurch violence. I would just suggest that it shouldn't have taken very long for Twitter for uh, for uh, Twitter to understand that. Senator Sullivan, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple follow-up questions, Mr. Slater. One to Senator Cruz's question. You know, I think it's. Um, whether a company wants to work with the Pentagon, I think, is uh, something that the leadership of the companies, uh, the individual companies have to make that decision. I think that's certainly something that's fine. I think what, what troubles a number of us is that we're, there's a declaration that you're not willing to work with the Department of Defense on certain issues, and yet there's a willingness to work with uh, one of our country's potential adversaries particularly on sensitive technological issues that are important to the competition between the two nations. Do you understand why that has caused bipartisan concern here? And how should we address that? Should Congress take action on those kind of situations? Not saying everybody has to work for the Pentagon, that's your decision, but if you don't want to work to help with our nation's defense, but you're working with the uh, the country that poses a very significant threat long term to the United States. Do you understand why that causes concern here? Senator, I do appreciate the concern. Uh, we are a proudly American company. We are a business that wants to draw responsible lines and we look forward to continue to engage with you and the committee and others to make sure we're doing that. Do you think if there's instances of that, a clear-cut example of, hey, we're not going to do anything on the nation's defense with the U.S. Department of Defense, but we're going to work with the Chinese, something very clear and obvious, do you think there's something that we should do to prevent that or penalize that, we, the Congress? I think it's an important question. I think uh, as a business, we try and strike responsible and consistent lines. Um, but I, you know, the details would, would certainly have to matter. Okay. Mr. Pickles, let me ask just a, one final question. It's a, really a follow-up to Senator Scott's earlier question. You said that the Twitter account of um, Maduro in Venezuela has not, quote, broken any of the rules. What are those rules? And at what point would you look to have somebody who's uh, – Certainly not treating his citizens well, as Senator Scott's been a leader on this issue, but, um, you know, what, what are those rules and at what point would you look at what they're doing to their own citizen as a way to maybe uh, not provide them the platform that you have? Thank you. Well, well firstly, the rules that apply to, to any um, user on Twitter are the same. Oh, I understand um, that. And so I can make, make a, a full copy available. And it will be, for example, um, whether it's encouragement of violence, if, if the Twitter account was used um, in some of the ways that we have seen uh, around the world to encourage violence against minorities, uh, to organize violence, uh, we would take action on those accounts breaking those rules. What we will also do... Would Twitter allow Putin to have an account or Xi Jinping to have an account? Um, if, if they were acting within our rules, but one thing I would note um, is, and this is slightly different but important, some, worldly, some, some governments have sought to manipulate our platform to spread propaganda and information through breaking our rules. One of those governments is Venezuela, and we have made a public declaration of every account that we removed from Twitter for engaging in information operations covertly that we believe is responsible for that government. We've made that whole archive available to the public and to researchers. We've taken the same step with information operations that have been directed, we believe, from countries including China, Iran, and Russia, because we believe that it's not just the, the, those single Twitter accounts, that some governments do also see to manipulate our platform, and where they do so, we will take action to remove that manipulation and make it public so people can learn from what's being... So if a government takes violence against its own citizens, is that breaking the Twitter rules? Um, well, I think that, that activity is happening offline, and the key question for us is what's happening on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan, and thank you to our witnesses. Um, the hearing record will remain open for two weeks. During this time, senators are asked to submit any questions for the record. Upon receipt, the witnesses are requested to submit their 
complete written answers to the committee as soon as possible, but no later than Wednesday, October 2nd, 2019, by close of business. Thank uh, each and every one of you for appearing today. This hearing is now adjourned.